Good morning once again as uh, we gather together for another service here at the Bible Tabernacle and I just pray that the Lord will bless you on this Lord's Day. I want to ask you to uh, pray for uh, the family of a uh, longtime friend of mine, uh, Marty Moorhart. Uh, he was a supporter of our ministry and a man that I knew for over 30 years and he went home to be with the Lord uh, last week. And uh, we just ask that you will uh, keep the family in prayer at this time, that the Lord will grant them his peace and comfort during this time of sorrow. Well, as we go to uh, God's word here this morning, uh, I would encourage you to take notes, not so much on what I'm going to say, on what I'm teaching, but to make a note of many of the passages that uh, we will be looking at here this morning. A long-held Protestant doctrine is that of eternal security. And that is, once saved, you are always saved. You cannot lose your salvation. It all begins with the new birth that our Lord Jesus told to Nicodemus. He stated in John chapter 3 and verse 3, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You must be born from again, born from God. We are born of God. He is the one who produces that new birth, that new life within us. We read in John chapter 1 and in verse 13, Regarding the new birth and, and believing on him who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Basically, salvation is not inherited. Salvation is not simply a, a personal choice. We see in... Uh, John chapter 6 and verse 44, where the Lord said there that no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. So we must be drawn to faith in God by God himself. Nor is it made by others. For example, joining a, a religion and uh, the leader waves his arms and sprinkles you perhaps with some holy water and declares you, okay, you're in. But rather, salvation is of God. It's his work. He is the one who brings us to himself, and he is the one who regenerates us. When we come to him, he will not throw us out, as it were. We see this in John chapter 6. And in the 37th verse, The Lord says, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. No one will be turned away whom the Father brings unto the Son. We see in a couple verses later, verse 39, where it says, This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing. I will lose absolutely no one but will raise them up on the last day. So there is the assurance that we have from our Lord Jesus Christ, that our salvation is intact, that we belong to the Lord. He's the one who draws us to himself, he regenerates us, and he also preserves us. We see in John chapter 5, and in verse 24, just a passage that I love. Truly I say to you, Jesus said, He who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death unto life. The one who believes in him, you have everlasting life. You should really mark the, the word there, has. Because that, that's referring to to present tense. That's something that when you trust in Christ that you have at that moment, you have everlasting life. And you will not come into judgment. 
You are exempt from God's condemnation. You have passed from death unto life. The word, mean, word passed means to cross over. You've made a transition. You, you are no longer on that path to death where the Lord uh, made the distinction between the two gates, the two ways. Broad is the way, wide is the gate that leads to destruction. Many there be which go in thereat. But straight is the gate, narrow is the way which leads to life, and few there be that find it. We're no longer on that broad path to destruction, but we're now on that narrow path to life everlasting. We have crossed over. We have changed. Uh, we are now in a, a different classification. In the parable that Jesus told about the rich man and Lazarus, Abraham is speaking with the rich man who is in torment. And he has requested Lazarus to come over and to uh, offer him a, a drink. But Abraham says that is not possible. And we read in Luke 16 and verse 26, where Abraham says, Besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. There is this great chasm. This, this huge gap, if you will, something on the order of the, the Grand Canyon. And Abraham said it's just not possible for one who belongs in paradise or heaven to pass to hell, nor from one who is in hell to, to uh, go to heaven. And that's once the uh, eternal destiny has finally been determined. But as it applies to this passage here in John 5, 24, the Lord is telling us that when we come to faith in him, we have passed over, we have crossed over, and we're no longer on the other side of that great divide. And once we are there, our salvation is then locked in. It is something that is certain. Even before we get to heaven, it is something that we receive from God right now. We are secure by him. Really, if there wasn't any other passage on eternal security that we would find in the Bible, John 5, 24 would be sufficient. In John chapter 10, we see what the Lord says further along these lines in verse 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life. I lo love the way that's worded in Scripture. I give them eternal life. Life everlasting is a gift from God, and we just receive that from his loving hand. He gives that to us. We don't earn it. They shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. It could not be stronger than what the war way the Lord has worded it here. They shall never perish. We shall never come under God's judgment. We will never receive his condemnation. We will not go to hell. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. We cannot be removed. We cannot lose our place. We cannot be pulled away from God, and we will not be turned away by him. My Father who has given them to me, and here we see that reiterated again in verse 29, is greater than all. There, there is none, none greater. And if he's holding us secure, how much more secure could we be? And no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. So he presses that point home for emphasis. No one is able to, to snatch us away. No one is able to remove us from the father's embrace. And from his care. And Jesus then says, I and my Father are one. This is that intimate union that the Lord Jesus, as the Son of God, has with the Heavenly Father. And that just serves to, to accentuate this uh, idea that we are secured then fully by God. We also have uh, Paul's many uh, comments uh, regarding our salvation in the book of Romans. We can look through a number of passages here in Romans which bear this out. 
Romans chapter 5 and verse 1. Paul says, therefore, being justified by faith. This goes back to what Paul had been teaching earlier, where Abraham believed God, and that was attributed to him for righteousness. There, therefore, we are justified or declared righteous by God through faith. And having been justified, Paul says, then we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have peace with God. We, we are at peace. We're no longer enemies of God. We're no longer uh, in conflict with God. We're no longer separated from God. We are now brought into union with the Lord. We are at peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So this is something that has been accomplished. We have peace with God. And that's what I wanted to stress is the word have. It's something that is a reality now. In fact, the word now pops up in some other verses. We see in verse 9 of Romans 5, much more than having now been justified by his blood. Notice that word now again. We have now been justified. It's not something future. It's not something that we have to wait and see. We don't keep our fingers crossed. We don't continue to pray to this end. Once we have received that salvation, we have now been justified by his blood. We shall be saved from wrath through him. So there's a promise. We will be saved when the time comes. We will be delivered, and that's already been accomplished. Verse 11 says, and not only that, that is not only have we been reconciled to God, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. We have now received the reconciliation. The word reconcile means to be made right. We've been restored to fellowship with God through our faith in Christ. And it is something that has occurred now. And so this is a, a very uh, real emphasis that we find uh, regarding our salvation now in the Lord. Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. We read, there is therefore now... No condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. There's that, that wonderful and precious, most valuable word that we find uh, used here with regard to, um, to our reconciliation, to our, our salvation in the Lord. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. We don't have to wait for it. We, we don't wait until... The time um, that we pass on and we go to stand before God in judgment, we're not sitting here sweating bullets and uh, being stressed out o over whether or not we're going to get into the kingdom of heaven. Once we know Christ Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we receive that permanent eternal waiver. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. So God's very, word is very clear on this. Romans chapter 8 is uh, the greatest chapter in, in the New Testament on the eternal security that we have in our Lord Jesus. And, and Paul wraps this up. I want to just go to his, uh, his summary, if you will, as he... Uh, uh, finalizes all that he has to say about our security in the Lord. And I'll begin with verse 31. Romans chapter 8, verse 31. What then, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, then who can be against us? That's pretty clear. If God is on our side, we have God's support, then what opposition do we have? He who did not spare his own son but delivered him up, him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? There, there's that love. There's the greatest demonstration that God is for us. He did not spare his own son. He gave him up as a sacrifice for our, us sinful human beings. And if God was willing to go that far, then what's he going to withhold from us? Such great love that he has demonstrated. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? 
We're elect. That means we were handpicked. We were chosen by God himself. And who will bring a charge against us? Who, who can accuse us of anything? Because it is God who justifies. God is the one who has declared us righteous. He has made us righteous before him. And it was all through Christ's death because he paid our penalty. He took care of it. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. So not only did he die on our behalf and become our substitute, but he is also praying for us. He is there, he intercedes. We read in 1 John chapter 2 that he is our advocate. That, that's a, a, a public defender, if you will. He's our uh, attorney, our defense attorney. And there he intercedes on our behalf. So we see this active role that the Lord Jesus Christ plays on our behalf. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And I just love this series of questions that Paul uses to just hammer this home. Who shall charge, uh, who shall bring a charge against uh, God's elect? Who is he who condemns? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Again and again and again, Paul drives this point home. Nothing can separate us from, we're, we're, we're secure in him. We belong to the Lord. And, and it's just vital that we have this because we're just so prone to doubt. It's our, our own sinfulness that uh, causes these questions to arise and produces anxiety within our spirit. But nothing will separate us from the love of Christ. And Paul brings up examples. So, shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness, or peril, or sword, any type of circumstance that you could possibly encounter in this world, is that an example that God has abandoned you? That he has forsaken you? That he has dumped you? That he no longer loves you? Paul says, no matter what trials we go through, whatever produces distress in our life, experiencing the worst persecution, Hunger without the basic necessities, even if we're lacking, whether our lives are in jeopardy or the sword, which is a symbol of death. None of that means that God does not love us. None of that separates us from him. In fact, the Lord told us in advance that we were going to go through trials. We were going to experience persecution. That was going to be a part of the Christian life. When he calls us to himself, he said that we're to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow him. And this is an example of what taking up our cross would entail. As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Paul says, yea, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So Paul compares us to the the, the great victors, the, the warriors of his day back in Roman times. And we could even apply that illustration to Olympic athletes and others who would be, um, who would be great heroes, who would be uh, admired, and uh, they, they would experience the, the wealth, the, the, the spoils of victory that would come along with that. And so Paul, they, they would be bought placed on a pedestal, and, and Paul is, is placing our lives there as believers. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities, nor things present nor things to come, nor height nor depth nor any other created thing. In fact, Paul just pulls out all the stops, as it were, anything in all creation, everything that he can think of in the spiritual as well as the physical realm, uh, in, in the world of, of angels, uh, whether it's uh, in, in this life or in that, uh, that other dimension where uh, the angels and the demons live. Absolutely nothing in all of creation throughout the universe shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What a marvelous promise that we have from God this assurance that we receive from him.
Peter also weighs in on our eternal security. As he was writing to believers who were going through tremendous suffering in the book of 1 Peter, he refers to them as pilgrims because they were scattered and many had lost their homes and uh, so here they were uh, displaced in a lot of other countries where they were foreigners. They were strangers, and Peter writes in 1 Peter 1, 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy, and it's so vital that they take hold of that truth, his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away. It is reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God. That word kept means that you are protected. It refers to being guarded or secured. And who is it that we are protected by? Who is it that is caring for us? Who's watching over us? The power of God. It is God himself through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. So we have the salvation. We're just waiting until the time that it finally will become revealed. We will then experience it. It will be ours. So these believers who are going through abuse and going through these difficult trials, Peter assures them that their future, their inheritance was certain. They were not abandoned by God. Over in 1 John, John himself writes regarding our uh, eternal security in the Lord. We'll begin here in 1 John 5 and verse 11. And this is the testimony. In other words, this is the gospel record. That God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. God has given us eternal life. That, that, that's just a tremendous thing to, to realize. He's given it to us. He's not going to take it back. This life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. So verse 12 is, is something that uh, is very clear on this. When you have the Son of God, you have life. Not will have, might have, but you have life, and this is life eternal. If you do not have the Son of God, you do not have this life. And then verse 13, he says, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. So John wrote these words so that we might know. We might have that certainty to just to eliminate that doubt in our hearts that we might realize that we have life everlasting. Paul writes, going back to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, that we are sealed by God. We have this seal from him. We'll read this here in verse 21 of 2 Corinthians in the first chapter. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us. God is the one who has established us in Christ with our salvation. He anoints us, and that anointing is the Holy Spirit who has also sealed us. He has sealed us. The, the term seal was uh, a mark of, of ownership. And uh, we could think of a, a seal that might be put on a, a title deed. And this is something that was uh, done back in those days. I also like to think in terms of a brand that a rancher would use on cattle uh, to identify them as his. Uh, those brands are, are permanent. They're marked into the flesh of the, the steer. 
so it is with us. We receive God's brand, his seal of ownership. We've been sealed by him. And he's given us, furthermore, the Holy Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. So that's the guarantee of our salvation. And I love the word that is used there, guarantee, which uh, is also rendered as, as uh, security or as a down payment. Something that uh, served as assurance that uh, the object is uh, possessed, that, that you have possession of uh, that particular item. And in this particular case, uh, our salvation is uh, secured by God. We, we are his possession, as it were. And thus it is something which is guaranteed. And so he guarantees our salvation. He guarantees heaven. Paul brings this up again in chapter 5. Chapter 5 and in verse 5, Paul wrote there, Now he who has prepared us for this very thing, that is immortality, is God, who also has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So God is the one who's prepared us for immortality, for eternal life with him. And then he has also given us the Holy Spirit who serves as the guarantee of everlasting life. Paul also uh, addresses this in Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians 1 and verse 13, where he wrote, In him you also trusted, that is in Christ, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So there's that sealing again. And so this occurs at the moment of salvation. When we believed, we heard the, the gospel message, we trusted in the Lord Jesus as a result of that. And so upon having believed, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit. So there's that seal of ownership that we receive from God and the Holy Spirit serves as the guarantee of our inheritance. He guarantees heaven for us. So we have this promise given again and again and again and again throughout Scripture. Until the redemption of the purchased possession. We are the purchased possession. That is, we're his possession. We were purchased by the blood of Christ. And our redemption is when the Lord God takes us home to be with him. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30, Paul writes, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So sin in our life does not result in the removal of the Holy Spirit or the loss of our salvation, but we can grieve the Holy Spirit, cause sorrow as a result of any sinfulness in our life. Because Paul says we were sealed by him for the day of redemption. And so we must address the, the issue of sin in our life, but we do not lose the Holy Spirit. We are possessed by him as well at the same time that he is our possession because he resides in our hearts. And remember, too, that we were chosen by God. Look here at Ephesians uh, chapter 1 and verse 4. Where Paul writes here, just as he, that is God, chose us in him before the foundation of the world. We were chosen in him before the foundation of the world, before anything was created. We have been selected by God. And what does he want? What, what, for what purpose did he choose us? That we should be holy and without blame before him in love. God chose us to be holy and to be without blame before him in love. And so here really is the, the flip side of this particular issue. We are saved. So what, what does that mean in our life? Can we just keep on sinning? You know, Paul over in Romans chapter 6 makes this statement uh, where he says, God forbid, 
or certainly not. He says, shall we, what shall we say then in verse 1 of Romans 6? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Absolutely not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in sin? We have been changed. We have been given a, a new life. And uh, we read in verse 4 where he says that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And so here's the question that we're, we're looking at here. Now that we're saved, we know that we belong to the Lord. Our salvation is secure. It cannot be lost. Does that mean we just keep on doing things and, and living as we have? Does anything change? Is it possible for you to then walk away from Christ? And if so, are you still saved? Does anything matter? Well, we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, a well-known verse, especially in our church. Many of us have that memorized. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So that is what transpires. That is what takes place when we have trusted in Christ. Everyone that is now in Christ is a new creature a new creation. We have been born again, as Jesus said. We have a new life, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. All of that produces a change, and that's found in uh, Titus 3.5. Over in John chapter 15, we see the work that the Lord does in the life of those then who belong to him. Because the Lord will produce a change. We see in John 15 where the Lord was instructing his disciples at the Last Supper. He said, I am the true vine. This is in the first verse. And my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Now notice that. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit. What we have illustrated here are just all human beings. And those that the Lord has given life who do not bear fruit, basically are not saved, they are removed. In fact, uh, we see in verse 6 where it says, If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. So there's the destruction of those who do not belong to Christ. And the evidence of that is the fact that they're not fruitful. They are not productive. He goes on to say, every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. So the teaching here that we find in Scripture is that salvation will result in fruitfulness. The Lord prunes us. He takes us through this pruning process. Well, what does that mean? What, what, is, what does the Lord do? Well, we see over here in Hebrews chapter 12, where it talks about the chastening or the discipline of the Lord in the lives of those who belong to him. And the writer of Hebrews is quoting from uh, these Old Testament passages where he says, my son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, do not be discouraged when you are rebuked by him for whom the Lord loves. He chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. In verse 7, he says, if you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. So basically he's saying, take heart, be positive, perk up, realize that God deals with you as with his child. You are his. For what son or daughter applies here as well? is there whom a father does not chastening. So this is the pruning that uh, he takes us through because he is working with us to weed out the, the dross, as it were, the impurities in our life, the things that don't belong. He's removing the sin so that we might become holy, that we might grow and develop into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. Verse 10, he says, For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, referring to our earthly fathers. 
But he, that is our heavenly father, will chasten us for our profit. He knows what is beneficial for us, that we may be partakers of his holiness. That is the reason why he chastens us. Now, no chastening or discipline seems to be joyful for the present, but it is painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So one thing is very clear in Scripture. The Lord will change, uh, chasten us, he will discipline us, or he prunes us, as it were, which is also a painful process, because pruning means uh, trimming the branches, cutting uh, the dead uh, pieces away. And so the Lord is working in our life. And if you belong to him, this is a, a mark of knowing Christ, the mark of a, a Christian, of being a disciple of the Lord, because uh, he, as your heavenly father, will lovingly be doing what is necessary in your life to make you holy. In James chapter 1 and verse 2, James wrote, My brother, encountered all joy when you fall into various trials. When you're going through all kinds of different trouble and struggles in your life. And for everyone, it, it's, it's going to be different. We don't all go through the same thing. And that's the whole idea behind various trials. Because for one person, it may be a disability. Uh, for one person, it could be a financial setback. For somebody else, it, it could just be any number of things that we may be experiencing in our life that serves as a trial because they are varied. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. The testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect, which speaks of being mature. And here we're referring to being spiritually mature or finished and complete. The King James uses the word entire. It means to be made whole. And in other words, we, we have everything in, in our life uh, to make us fit as believers. And I think in terms of, of the fruit of the Spirit, which is produced within us, which makes us complete. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. This is what the Lord God is producing within us. And so he accomplishes this through trials. We will be perfect, we will be complete, not lacking anything in any way. So this is what God accomplishes in the lives of his saints. When Jesus told the parable of the sower, he made a distinction between those who were truly saved and those who were not. We see the parable of the sower in Matthew chapter 13. And the Lord Jesus offered his explanation uh, of this parable beginning in the 18th verse and he talks about the the seed some of it was uh, tossed onto uh, the road uh, other seed was tossed under rocky soil others in soil that had thorns and then there were other seed that went into soil that was fertile now it's been taught that the seed that landed in the rocky soil and the the soil that had the thorns that those are backslidden believers because they embraced the gospel, they came to know the Lord, and then they fell back in to a life of sin. But that is actually not the case at all. Those are all unbelievers because there's no lasting change in their life. Basically, they go back to their old way of life. If it were the case that those were actually believers, then that would contradict 2 Corinthians 5.17. The, the old things have passed away and all things have become new. Our life is changed. And the Lord is just pointing out that this is superficial belief. It has no staying power. Those that uh, fall uh, among uh, rocks, their, their, their superficial faith only lasts until trials come their way and then pff, they're, they're gone, they're out of here. And then the others just go back to the cares of the world. And they, they lose interest in Christ and in the things of God. Believers are those who bear fruit. 
And there may be some that are going to bear more fruit than others. And we could compare this with the rewards that we read about in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, where Paul talks about building on the foundation, which is Christ. It may be wood, hay, stubble, then there's gold, silver, and, and gems. But um, here we, we see where some form of fruit is born uh, on the part of those who belong to Christ. Because those in Christ are new creations. Old things have passed away. God, by virtue of his work in the life of his child, through the Holy Spirit, does not allow sin to persist. He does not allow sin to persist. God deals with it. In Ephesians chapter 2, we're familiar with verses 8 and 9, which, say, which reads here, For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should take credit. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This is really a, a key part of Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. We are his workmanship. So we were created or saved unto this end. We were created in Christ Jesus for good works. And I want you to notice the contrast. Because in verse 9, it says that salvation is a gift of God, not of works. So in other words, we don't work to attain our salvation, but good works is the result of our salvation. We then operate or, or build on that foundation that we have in Christ Jesus. So God prepared us for good works. So we were saved to glorify him through that, which it says God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And so this is indicative. This is the, a sign. This is evidence. This is proof that you have salvation is the good works then that uh, result uh, in your life because of what God has done to produce a change. You don't go back to sin. You don't go back to your old way of doing things. There, there's that work that God performs within us. Philippians 1.6 says, Being confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. That's what God says he will do in our life. And this is a work which continues until we find ourselves in heaven. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 14 also offers a, another uh, passage uh, which uh, would tie into all of this. Hebrews 10, 14, for by one offering, he, that is our Lord Jesus, has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. He has perfected forever, meaning that, that we were made perfect in him as a result of our salvation for all time, from now uh, right on through eternity. And this applies to those who are being sanctified. In other words, once you come to know Christ, then there's the process of sanctification, that is, being made holy, conforming to the image of our Lord, becoming like him. And so it follows that those who have been perfected and belong to the Lord then are going through this sanctification process. This is what God is doing on our behalf. Paul wrote here in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 19, Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands, having this seal, there we have the, the word seal that's uh, being used here again. Having this seal, this gives it that certainty. The Lord knows those who are his. The Lord knows who, those who are his. And we read about these passages um, in uh, the Gospel of John. I know my sheep. The Lord knows those who are his, especially if you're his child. What parent doesn't know who his children are? The Lord knows those who belong to him. And let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. So that, that is the, the territory or the terrain, if you will, that you, you enter. 
the, the geography, if you will, of God. You now uh, live in his abode. You belong to him. You've entered his realm. You belong to the church. And so uh, your life is going to be marked by a departure from sin. One way or another, this is what God is going to accomplish. So there's a connection here between coming to Christ and pursuing holiness. James speaks about this connection between faith and works in James chapter 2. In verse 14, when he said, What does it profit, my brother, and if someone says he has faith, but does not have works, can faith save him? In other words, is it just faith in and of itself without any evidence that you have been saved, that you do have real faith? And so here's the connection that James makes between saving faith and what results in our life. He gives an example of helping someone who is in need. This is the outworking of the believer's faith. And then in verse 17 he says, Thus also by faith itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Just as somebody who just tells somebody, Okay, well, go on your way and we... Uh, hope that you'll be taken care of without actually providing for their needs. What good does that do? So it is with faith, if it is not accompanied by works, is dead. In other words, faith without works is a faith that is non-existent. It is not real. Over in uh, verse 20, James here just stresses this point again. He says, But do you want to know, foolish man, that faith without works is dead? And he repeats that point again also in verse 26. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Now, it's important to understand that James is not contradicting what Paul says, that uh, we believe God and that's counted uh, as righteousness. Uh, for by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works. But rather he complements what Paul has to say. Because yes, it's simply through faith in Christ that we receive salvation. It's not of works. But the point is, according to James, is that those who have genuine faith in the Lord, their lives are going to be accompanied then by good works. That serves as evidence or proof of genuine faith. Verse 18, he says that someone will say, You have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. So James makes it very clear that you can't demonstrate your faith without without any works in your life, and that is the works of God. You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe, and they tremble. So he makes it clear from that statement that even Satan and his angels, they believe in God. They know that he exists. They know that he is real. But they don't have their trust in the Lord. They are not obedient to him. They do not follow the Lord. They have not committed their lives, obviously, to him. And so it is with us. It can't be something which is just intellectual. Oh, yeah, I believe in God. I believe in Christ. True faith means that we have committed our life to him. We follow him as Lord. Faith is accompanied or proven by works. Faith without works is no faith at all. So we see that true believers come under God's discipline. That is one point that we want to stress here. He prunes us. The second is that true believers, they will bear fruit. They exhibit their faith through good works. And then thirdly, true believers persist in their faith no matter what. True faith endures. And this is a point that is made by the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 10 in verse 38, he says, The just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition or to destruction, 
to God's condemnation, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. So here the writer of Hebrews makes it clear that those who truly belong to the Lord and have committed themselves to him in faith, that their faith will continue. And then he proceeds in chapter 11 to actually prove that point. In the first verse, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The word substance refers to the, the confidence or the conviction of that which we hope for with expectation. We are waiting. The evidence of things not seen, the proof or the reality is something that, that is not visible or experienced right now. But uh, we have that faith that this is going to occur. We don't see heaven, but we know that it's coming. And throughout the book of, or rather, throughout the chapter 11 of Hebrews, uh, the writer is illustrating this. Those saints from Abel all the way to those who wandered in the deserts and lived in caves that we read at the end of the chapter, they never shrank from their faith. They did not quit. They pressed on. Those who withdraw from the faith are called apostate. That's the term that is used in the New Testament. They were never truly saved to begin with. Their faith was never real. And this is something that is really stressed in Scripture. We can't say that when somebody came down the altar and responded to an invitation or they gave their heart to Christ, that they're saved or ever were, were, were really saved if later on they deny the Lord and they turn away from the gospel, they just go back to a, a life of sinfulness as the way they had lived before they supposedly came to know the Lord. The scripture teaches that they were never saved to start with. We read here in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 19 what John says regarding those who are the Antichrist, those who are in opposition to the, the gospel. And primarily this would apply to false teachers, but it, it pertains to anyone that had made a profession of faith, but then they end up turning away from God's fellowship. They went out from us, we read, but they were not of us. They, they, they never really belonged to the fold. They weren't part of the, the Christian family. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that, that it might be made manifest, that it might be made known that none of them were of us. They never did belong to the, the believers. They would have continued, he says. Real believers don't quit because God does not give up on them. He does not let us go. We are kept, as we read in 1 Peter uh, 1, 5, we are kept by the power of God. We are secured by him. Back in the 1930s, or excuse me, 1940s, there were two up-and-coming evangelists, Charles Templeton and the other one many of us know very well, Billy Graham. They were friends and colleagues. They preached together. And they were known as the Gold Dust Twins back in the day. They went on a preaching uh, tour of Europe together. Charles Templeton was regarded as the most gifted preacher of the two. He was very intelligent and had an appealing personality. Charles Templeton actually overshadowed Billy Graham. He was considered more eloquent, more brilliant, and a more polished orator than Billy Graham, if you can imagine that. And those of us who were familiar with Billy Graham's preaching, that's, that's uh, kind of hard to fathom. Charles Templeton was a church planter. He preached at these youth rallies. He launched a ministry called Youth for Christ. Uh, even members of the Bible Tabernacle back in my early teenage days, we attended the Youth for Christ rallies in downtown L.A., he held a weekly TV program back in the 50s. He preached at evangelistic crusades to thousands of people across the U.S. Uh, back in the 50s, just as uh, Billy Graham did. And he once spoke for an entire week 
at Yale University. And then I believe it was back in, in 1957 that he announced that he was an agnostic. He rejected Christ. He rejected the gospel. He rejected scripture. He read books from people such as Thomas Paine, Voltaire, David Hume, Bertrand Russell, Aldous Huxley. Huxley. These were famous uh, intelligent intellectuals uh, who were all atheists. And he abandoned all Christianity and rejected the Bible. He wrote a memoir before his death which was titled Farewell to God. He wrote this about two years before he died. Maybe he should have written it Hello to God. He would have encountered him upon his death. Until the end of his life, he blasphemed Christ and he died in unbelief. Some may argue that he was still saved because at one point in his life, he had come to Christ. He had made a profession of faith. After all, you can't lose your salvation. But that is not what scripture teaches. We are not of those who draw back to condemnation, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. And this is what it means to be a true believer in Christ is that you will continue because you have the Holy Spirit. God has drawn you to himself. He's the one who preserves you. And he's going to work in your life to produce that growth. You don't just come to know Christ and then your faith fails. It doesn't work that way. Saving faith endures to the end. Yes, believers will fall into sin. After all, look at the Believers at the church of Corinth, as Paul wrote to the Corinthians, and all the problems that they had and sinfulness that was taking place there in the church. Consider the life of Samson and David, who are identified in Hebrews 11 as heroes of faith. They committed egregious sins, but they sought God's mercy and were forgiven. They never abandoned their faith in God. I want to close out my message here this morning with two passages. One in 1 Thessalonians. First Thessalonians chapter 5. Paul writes here, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. This is the work that God does in our life. And he will sanctify us completely. Fully. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is, your whole being, your entire being. Paul's petition is that we will be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus. And then he adds this promise in verse 24. He who calls you is faithful who will also do it. He who calls you is faithful. He will do it. And one last passage is found at the end of Jude, which serves also as a doxology. And I use it often as a benediction at the end of communion. In Jude 20, Jude wrote here, and Jude was one of the half-brothers of our Lord Jesus. Now to him, that is God, who is able to keep you from stumbling, to keep you from falling, to keep you from falling away is what it's, it's referring to. He keeps us from falling away from the faith. To present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Not only does he keep us from falling away, but he will present us faultless before the presence of his joy. How is it that we will be faultless? Because we will be clothed with the righteousness of his son, Jesus Christ. With exceeding joy, he says, to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Dear Lord God, how we thank you for these promises, these guarantees, Lord God, that you give us in your word. Our lives are completely secure in Christ. Not only that, there is that work of preservation in our lives. Lord, it's an ongoing process because not only do you save us, but then you sanctify us. 
you prune us, you chasten us. Lord, you are wor working in our lives sort of like a coach working with an athlete. And we find ourselves on this path like Christian in the story of Pilgrim's Progress as we make our way towards the celestial city. And, and it's, it's arduous, it's, it's hard, it's difficult. And there are times we just want to give up and just forget about it. But Lord God, you sustain us. And this is what your word tells us. And you will keep us from falling away from the truth. Lord, how we thank you, Lord, for your call. How we thank you, Lord God, that you are taking us to heaven to be with you. And it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.